Good afternoon, nerd fam, and welcome back to Databricks Data and AI Summit. We're here in San Francisco, and I am delighted because we happen to live here, which never happens for this tech crew traveling around the world. My name is Savannah Peterson, here with theCUBE, but more importantly, very excited to be joined by George from 5chan. George, thanks so much for being here. Very nice to be back. Thanks for bringing your svelte velvet, too. Yeah. You know how many blue Brooks Brothers suits I see sitting up here and how refreshing it is to see something that doesn't look like this that? This did not come from Brooks Brothers. That, <laughs> that definitely did not come from Brooks Brothers. And sorry to everyone who wears the Brooks Brothers, but you can do a little better than that blue blazer. I just got to say it while I have the opportunity. <laughs> George, I'm going to give you the opportunity to send you the CEO. This is your company. This is your baby. Give us the one line of pitch for Five Trans straight from the maestro's mouth. Fivetran gets all of the data from all of your company's business systems, be they databases like Oracle, uh, tools like Workday or Salesforce or ServiceNow or you name it. We get the data from all those systems and we replicate it and keep it up to date in your data platform of choice, for example, Databricks. You know, and I've heard rumor from other guests we've had from Fivetran on the show that it's super easy. Is that what your customers say? Is that why you've been a fan favorite? Uh, indeed. Uh, Fivetran is very easy. Sometimes I think sometimes it's too easy for some people. Some people is like to have well, knobs I mean, and, and fiddle. You know, uh, in the, but in yes, the dating we, world, maybe such thing is too easy. Is there such thing as too easy when it comes to tech? Well, for some people who are who have been engineering their own data pipelines for a long time, this can be a little bit bittersweet uh, to delegate responsibility oh, to someone else. Oh, it's giving up a little bit of control a little the, bit you there. Do, you do give up a little bit of control. But yeah. the good news is we've been doing this for 10 years. We're very good at it. Uh, we can deal with very difficult data sources. We have 500 connectors. Um, we can uh, go to extreme throughput and extreme latency. Uh, we can adapt to change, uh, and uh, we make it all very easy to use. And for most people, that is a good proposition. I, I like it. So, I'm no super expert, but pretty plugged into the pulse here. Databricks made some announcements this morning that could be very much interpreted as a little bit competitive with you. That is true. Our, our destination partners, uh, and we love them, uh, do like to uh, make a hobby out of writing connectors. Uh, and so Databricks had some announcements around some connectors uh, that they have built. So the reason this happens is because uh, the, connect the nature of the connectors business is it's actually pretty easy to build a connector that works some of the time, even most of the time. A good engineer can write a Postgres connector that works in the straightforward cases in a few days. Um, the problem is, and we know this because we've been doing it for a long time, uh, is it is extremely difficult to make a connector work 99.9% .9 of the time. And uh, for that reason, we feel very secure in the future of our business. Uh, we uh, have a breadth and performance capabilities and reliability that is unparalleled. Uh, we have 7,000 customers who use us for this, uh, and there's a good reason. And so I feel very comfortable about the future, but yes, it is true. Uh, all of our destination partners do like to build connectors now and then and do a little competing with us. Well, I think you have a great attitude about it because that 99.99999% reliability and consistency is exactly what customers are going to need. And speaking of customers, you work with some of the biggest customers in the world. You got a couple examples for me, right? Morgan Stanley, perhaps? Sure, yeah. Uh, we are very proud of our uh, customer base. Uh, we have customers across all sizes, all industries. Um, we started uh, years ago more in the technology industry. Uh, many of our early customers were in the Bay Area, but at this point uh, we cover we cover all, all industries and all sizes. So Morgan Stanley is a great example of a customer and a great example of why our business is so uh, difficult to do at scale. Uh, so Morgan yeah. Stanley uses us to replicate databases. Um, probably their most important type of database is Sybase, of which they have many. Uh, but Morgan Stanley has a lot of subsidiaries. So they have many different types of database. Uh, these databases are, some of them are on-prem, some of them are in the cloud. I was going to uh, say, they've got to be all over the world. Yeah, they're, yeah. All, they're all over the place. Uh, and uh, these databases generate uh, huge volumes of data and they have huge requirements around latency. Uh, and Vivetran's ability to reliably replicate data at scale uh, and when the databases are under pressure, which right. is when things really get hard, is why they choose us to do this. As well as our, our breadth of support that we have connectivity to all of their systems of record. And you've got a few other household names. Do you mind dropping them? Sure, yeah, another great customer example is uh, LVMH, uh, uh, a uh, 
a uh, company that I think is well known. Speaking of velvet blazers, although I don't know if they make one, I, you I know, know I really I, I was going. I love that you were going for a fashion brand there. Though. <laughs> I was like, bring it, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. I need I need to get something from them to wear to things like this. Hopefully, uh, they're listening right now and just fit you. That's there you what, go. And me while we're at there it, you just go. for yeah, the record. Exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so LVMH, they have set 75 subsidiaries, and they've chosen Fivetran as their data movement tool of choice across the entire uh, global company. And so you can imagine the diversity of data sources oh, yeah. involved in, in creating a single version of the truth for a company like LVMH. There are databases, there are marketing data sources, there are inventory data sources. Uh, it really runs the gamut, everything you can imagine. And it's going to take multiple years to implement all of these, but we're very excited to do it. And they're very excited to work with us in order to get that you know, customer 360, where you can connect all the dots, all yeah. the data points. In order to do that, um, you need to have that breadth. Uh, of coverage and Fivetran has unparalleled breadth. I, I love that and I think I, you, what you're talking about is as an end consumer of their product offerings and, the, and their retail, it will be able to have that hyper customized experience that we've always kind of been dreaming of when it comes to our fashion or our fit or whatever our luxury goods Absolutely. might be. Absolutely, you know it's funny, I yesterday I happened to buy a new tennis shirt at uh, Bori and I was trying to use the checkout process to explain to my boyfriend the concept of master data management and how this works. Like, well, this company will probably want to figure out <laughs> that I'm the same George Fraser as the one who bought something online and how does that all work behind the scenes. So. Okay, I adore that. You're at the POS <laughs> system, We're giving just a, a quick little hyper customization <laughs> AI chit chat to your boyfriend. That's, <laughs> well, that's the reality though. And maybe we'll get rewarded or prompted with something really cool there, or who knows, or at least, at least they'll know our shopping patterns to, <laughs> to a really minute degree, which may or may not be a good thing for our, for our wallets throughout the, <laughs> throughout the course of that experience. I'm curious when it comes to, so you talked a lot about how, I mean, that is a really broad scale implementation. I, I was going to ask how long it takes. You mentioned a couple years to fully roll out, which makes perfect sense given the number of systems that you're integrating here. Yeah. What are some of the short term value realization that these customers will have on the front end of starting this journey to help momentum stay through all that? Well, one of the great things about Fivetran is because it is so automated and because our, our approach to data replication is really mirroring, we create a mirror image of all of your systems of record inside your data platform as though the data just lives there. Um, and that means that you can very quickly set up a lot of different systems, get a lot of data uh, into your, your central repository, um, even without having to know exactly what you're bringing in. And yeah. you can start with your most important question, whatever that is for you as a business. Uh, so for a technology startup, it might be uh, about you know, funnel optimization. For a consumer packaged goods company uh, like Procter & Gamble, it's about inventory management and making sure that the right, uh, the, the right goods are in the right warehouses. Right. So there's a nice iterative element of implementing Fivetran. You know, the total implementation may never end because uh, the business is always changing, but you can really start with your most important question and then go from there rather than do some massive enterprise data management uh, you know, single schema project, which by the time it finishes, the whole business will be completely different and it will be unusable. And everyone's exhausted and isn't sure the tool is actually yes, going to solve Yes, everyone's already left problem. for other jobs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I can just see those meetings. We've all been in them as consultants or as outside forces. It's it's brutal. Do you feel like it's, do you, and maybe this is obvious, maybe it's not, do you feel like large enterprise know what their most important question is or is that a little bit of a competing challenge across different business units? Well, if it's a large enterprise, they're not going to have one most important question, but you can start with the first batch of, yeah. of key questions. And I mean, sometimes they do. I, I think of like Geico, for example, as a customer, and uh, their most important question is the effectiveness of their ad spend hour by hour, uh, even minute by minute during things like the Super Bowl. So there is an example of a big company which yeah. very clearly has one most important question. I kind of like when it's that simplified and you can really see if you're toggling it. Obviously a million of complex things going on there, but it's, it's, it's cool to think about. All right, I'm going to shift gears, and this is a little bit of a stretch of a question, but you got to roll with me because I think your company background is really interesting, especially living here in the Silicon Valley. A lot of very similar founder stories sometimes. I've been here for too long. I'm clearly a little jaded. Lots of talks about lakes today uh, and, and announcements about lakes. It turns out that you and your co-founder Taylor's family met over 100 years ago yes. building <laughs> lake cabins. All right, stay with me, audience. I know you think I'm nuts right now, but I promise that we're going for something. I think that's rather serious. 
serendipitous given the conversation. But I got to ask, and because I've done business with friends and I'll keep my opinion out of this, would you recommend starting a company with a friend like that? You know, it's interesting. Way back when uh, we started the company, uh, some people warned me about starting businesses with friends and they told me it was a bad idea. It has worked out really well for us. Um, I mean, clearly you're sitting here right now, so it's uh, yeah, a good sign. I, I think uh, we've worked incredibly well together. My co-founder and I are very different, and uh, I think that helps. Uh, yeah, and, I, I, I agree. And it, it has really been, uh, you know, a great, uh, a great part of my life uh, working with him to build this company together. So for me, it's been for, and I think for him as well, it's it's been <laughs> it's been fantastic. Well, um, your mileage may vary. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I think I I think that's great, and it's actually really heartwarming to hear. You know, there's a lot of AI founders out there, most of them concentrated right here in the Silicon Valley in our backyard. What would be your advice to those who are early on the founder journey? You've been in it for over a decade, so you've seen some of the ups and downs of this hype cycle. What's your advice to the young founders today? Well, if you're like we were and you're founders without yeah. a pedigree, you, you have to claw your way up from zero and you will have no credibility with anyone and you have got to find a problem that somebody needs solved so badly that they will buy a solution from you know, this tiny company started by two people not from the industry with no credentials. Uh, and, and you need to be very real about that if you're that kind of founder about you, you, you've got to find some, something that for some segment of the market is so discontinuous uh, that it will get you from zero to one. It's a little different you know, if you're like Databricks and you're coming out of a uh, famous lab at a university, or if you're like Snowflake and you're started by you know people with a uh, long pedigree in the industry, they have they play a little bit of a different game. But you asked about you know a lot of oh, these startup founders about. today yeah. are, are people you know like I was uh, yeah. with no with no pedigree, and uh, you just you have to you have a very specific challenge you have to solve when you're in that situation. I, I, it's know your niche and know it to the tiniest little note of that niche. The, the key, though, is that niche needs to be the beginning of something that grows very big. Otherwise, you will have a very small company. And for Fivetran, you know, that initial... I was just uh, going to ask. That initial niche, niche was people who, uh, who prioritize time to value above everything else. Because Fivetran is so automated, you really can set up a, a full-fledged data warehouse in an hour with Fivetran if your data sets are not too big. That's and awesome. For, for some very small companies, you know, technology startups in the Bay Area, that was a real thing that they wanted to do. They wanted it up and running today. Yeah. Uh, and they would have maybe one person who was doing everything from, you know, managing the platform to delivering reports to the executive team. And so our, our extraordinary degree of automation was what was so discontinuous about us. Yeah. And now as the years have gone on, we sell to all kinds of companies. Uh, we have other uh, properties like uh, our performance and our reliability that we've developed over time. The automation is still very valuable though. It, it's valuable in a slightly different way at big companies. Um, for small companies, the reason automation is so valuable is because it's so fast to set up. Big companies, fast to set up is nice, but is not actually that important for them. Uh, it's what automation does for big companies is it makes five chain very easy to maintain. Maintenance is the nightmare at big companies. No uh, headaches once we're on. Yeah, once you're on, it's very set it and forget it. And, and people at big companies love that about us. But you know, we definitely we started in a niche, uh, yeah. which is like weird people who want to have a data warehouse set up tonight. Uh, that was kind of five chain's original original customer base, and then we grew out from there. I love that. Where are you going to grow out now that you're at seven thousand customers? Where are you going to blossom to you from know, here then? Data replication is a huge business. It's kind of a hidden business. It's something, it's like plumbing. You know, people don't tend to talk about it. It's not the, the thing uh, the that sexy people dinner tend to bring up. It's not, it's Although not. Although you're doing it at the POS moment buying clothes. There you go. Yeah. I, well, I try to connect it to the real world. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, uh, it, but it is a, it is, it is a giant. Uh, it, it is a ubiquitous. Every company uh, above a certain size and age will have a central data platform where they replicate all their systems of record and they will either need to use Fivetran or they will need to build it themselves is what actually most people do today. So, you know, what the next few uh, years look like is just continuing to persuade people, uh, many of whom are here at this conference, who are accustomed to writing code to build data pipelines and, 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 and doing it all themselves that like, hey, 
for the replication piece, it just really doesn't make any sense anymore. Like we are so good at it, we are reasonably yeah. priced. I think people will look back and it will seem as ridiculous in retrospect to write your own connectors as to um, like uh, write your own email server which is a thing people used to do, uh, I, th I think. I was alive then, still for the record, yes, yeah. <laughs> that's that's the journey we are on, is, yeah. is convincing everyone to maybe like put down your keyboard and uh, let uh, let someone else solve the problem of replicating your Postgres database into your Databricks. I love that, put down the keyboard. I'm ready to be done with my keyboard. You all ready to be done with your keyboard? I'm looking at the production guys. Yeah, I think they're definitely ready to be done with their keyboards over there. All right, I got two more questions for you. And this one's kind of cool. So when I think of charismatic tech CEO, I don't always think of PhD neuroscientist. This is your background. How did you make the leap from studying that to knowing you wanted to be an entrepreneur? You, you know, you talk about being a no pedigree or a non pedigree founder. You're clearly an educated founder, but there must have been some sort of pivot that catalyzed you to want to come do it, this. It, it is true. Before I was a tech CEO, I was a scientist, uh, and uh, that was. Uh, it was a different chapter of my life. I, I loved the work I did when I was a scientist. I'm, I'm very proud of it. I think I contributed in a small way uh, to the enterprise of science, which is the most important thing I think that humanity does. I decided not to stay in academia, and I, uh, I joined a biotech company after graduate school, started by um, two college friends, actually, and I was there for a couple years. And, and I, I had the idea of entrepreneurship um, you know, going way back to being a kid, I had sort of set it aside and, and taken a different path for eight years, uh, but then I ultimately decided to go back to that. I joked that I wasn't brave enough to start a biotech company, uh, so I started a software company, and there was, there was, a, there was a process of evolution. Uh, data integration was not our original idea, um, so there was a process at the beginning there, but we were, we were very determined and we were very patient, and, uh, and we were very smart. I sometimes joke that the secret of Five Trans success is that we are the smartest people who are willing to work on this problem. <laughs> I, I love the humility and, and the honesty there. So your advice to those founders or to, to someone in school would, would be to go for it, yeah? I mean, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong in changing careers. I yeah. think sometimes people think that their whole life journey has to make sense. Everything has to be leading into oh the next thing, and it absolutely does not. <laughs> uh, and uh, you're not too old to change direction. And mm -mm. and the people who have been doing it for 10 years, you know, experience is uh, less valuable than people think. Uh, you can catch up. Oh, I love that. No, all right, final question for you, just so that we can use the highlight before we have you on the show next time. We'll call it a year from now. It doesn't have to be this show. We'll see. I suspect we'll see you before then. But what do you hope to be able to say a year from now that you can't quite say today? I, I hope that our... Uh, uh, our, our data lake offering is, an, is 10 times bigger than it is today. It's, it's one of our fastest growing uh, platforms. And uh, there's a lot of talk about data lakes right now, including at this conference. One of the really cool things about data lakes is that you can build a truly vendor neutral data lake uh, and, uh, and, and, and still use your, the platforms you love, like Databricks, mm -hmm. um, but you can control your data to an even higher degree. And Fivetran can help you do that. And it's growing really well, and I hope a year from now, it'll be 10 times bigger than it is today. Awesome. And then we've got some custom fits from your fabulous customers, perhaps. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, if we're lucky. George, thank you so much for this. This was, this was absolutely fantastic. I love it. We covered everything from the future to fashion, and we can't wait to have you back on theCUBE. Very nice to be with you. Yeah, and thank all of you for tuning in. Wherever you might be on this beautiful rock, we're in San Francisco, California, at Databricks Data and AI Summit. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.